you, Tommy, for appearing with us. It's a great pleasure to see you and to hear you as well very shortly. I'm happy to say that Tammy and I have known one another and worked closely with one another over many years. We met first at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She taught Hebrew there for a number of years. We were both troubled by the rise of anti-Semitism that was notable way back then. To her credit, uh, Tammy has been a pioneer in the in directing attention uh, to anti-Semitism on American campuses in particular. Amcha, the initiative that she developed about 11 years ago, has kept a steady, very sober eye on developments on American campuses. If, as is the case, we know lots today about the campus as often inhospitable venues for anti-Israel and anti-Jewish hostility to a large degree, Tammy, it's owing to your good work. You've persisted, plugged away, uh, and clarified a great deal about uh, the situation on the campus scene. What you're going to be telling us today doesn't look at the universities in America, but at schools, especially in California. But as we know, what begins in California doesn't stay in California. So the topic you're addressing today, while it seems to be localized to the state where you live, in fact, has very broad implications and ramifications for education and the politics of education well beyond that. Uh, enough from me. It's now my pleasure to turn over to you. We look forward to your talk and to engaging you in questions, answers, and discussion following. Well, thank you, Alvin, for your generous introduction and for inviting me to be part of this wonderful webinar series. I'm really honored to be here. And many thanks to those of you who are giving up part of your Sunday to learn more about the California ethnic studies controversy. So in 2013, only 1% of California's high schools offered a course in ethnic studies. By 2025, a mere dozen years later, 100% of the state's public and charter high schools are supposed to be offering and all of its students required to take a course in ethnic studies that's likely to contain explicit and implicit anti-Semitic content, almost guaranteed to incite bigotry toward Jewish students and the Jewish community. I'll be speaking today about why this warp speed transformation was set in motion, how it's been unfolding, the anti-Semitism at the heart of it, and what if anything can be done about it. But first, a caveat. In this presentation, I'll be telling you a story. Let's call it the California Ethnic Studies Saga. And as with any story, the storyteller has to make choices about how to organize a large number of events and an enormous number of details. She has to decide where to begin and end the story, what events to highlight, and what details to include and omit. The story that I'll be telling you is one of many that could be and have been told about ethnic studies in California. This story differs from those in its singular goal of attempting to understand what is really driving the push for ethnic studies in the state, an understanding that I believe is prerequisite for developing effective strategies to address it. So now I'm gonna to move to my PowerPoint. So this story begins in 1968 at San Francisco State, one of the first campuses of the California State University system. 
In November of that year, students from the Black Student Union and the Third World Liberation Front initiated a five-month strike, the longest in U.S. history. The strike resulted in the immediate establishment of the nation's first departments of Black and ethnic studies, including La Raza, Asian American, and Native American studies, to be housed in a separate school of ethnic studies. These were the demands of the strikers who believed these programs would revolutionize the white racist elitist institution and provide students of color with tools to achieve self-determination and fight the oppression of their communities. In order to understand the anti-Semitism that would ultimately spring from this new discipline, it's important to appreciate the following ways in which ethnic studies, as it was established at San Francisco State, was a radical break from longstanding scholarly tradition. First, unlike other disciplines that entered the academy by proving their scholarly worth, ethnic studies was established as a response to the threats of its student proponents, many of whom were closely allied with paramilitary groups such as the Black Panthers and the Brown Berets. Secondly, ethnic studies was the first discipline to enter the academy with an explicitly political rather than scholarly mission that was rooted in a fusion of separatist nationalism with the third world internationalism that united nationalist groups in the service of anti-colonial struggle. Ethnic studies was never intended to study about specific ethnic groups. Rather, its goal was to contribute toward the liberation of these groups by revolutionizing both society and its educational institutions. Third, the new discipline's liberatory goals were expressed in highly politicized curricula promoting revolutionary nationalism, third world Marxism, and post-colonialism. These political philosophies create a binary division of society into oppressed and oppressor groups based on race and economic privilege. They vilify oppressor groups and promote the overthrow of systems of oppression, including through violence. Ethnic studies curricula were also rooted in critical pedagogy championed by Paulo Freire, which aims to bring these political worldviews and calls to action, known as critical consciousness, into education. This is why the discipline is often called critical ethnic studies. Finally, unlike other disciplines in the academy, which seek to provide students with the analytical tools to objectively evaluate knowledge and arrive at their own conclusions, critical ethnic studies starts with a set of foregone conclusions and ideological commitments that are imposed on students and must be adopted by them without question or debate. These include the acceptance of revolutionary political ideologies and their moral valuations and prescribed activism. Students who do not accept these uh, will generally not find themselves welcome in a critical ethnic studies classroom. Now let's look at the different ways in which the introduction of this highly politicized discipline opened the door to anti-Semitism in the academy and beyond. The basic conceptual framework of ethnic studies, its division of society into oppressed and oppressor groups 
based on race and economic privilege easily merges with anti-Semitic tropes of Jewish power, privilege, and malevolence to provide ready-made examples of Jews as individuals, an ethnic group, or a nation state as the quintessential white privileged oppressor, preventing national groups of color from achieving self-determination. These anti-Semitic tropes have been used in a few different ways by ethnic studies practitioners. Anti-Semitic portrayals of Jews as rich power brokers and bloodsuckers and false canards about Jews financing the, Ant the Atlantic slave trade, which are frequently associated with individuals like Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, were expressed by prominent Black studies scholars in the 1990s. More commonly in recent years, however, the anti-Semitic expression of critical ethnic studies practitioners derives from the anti-Semitic portrayal of Zionism as a racist settler colonial system of oppression that engages in the genocide, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid of an indigenous people of color, namely the Palestinians. According to ethnic studies scholars themselves, such anti-Semitic portrayals of Israel as the prototype of the evil settler colonial state have been a mainstay of the discipline since its inception. Add to these anti-Semitic portrayals the disciplinary imperative to vigorously fight the oppressor and dismantle oppression, and it's not hard to see why many ethnic studies faculty not only engage in anti-Zionist activism and BDS advocacy, but also promote such activism as legitimate disciplinary expression in their classrooms, departments, and professional associations. In fact, ethnic studies is among the most anti-Zionist disciplines in the academy. Consider the following. More than one third of all US faculty who support an academic boycott of Israel have a primary or secondary affiliation in a university ethnic studies program. More US departments of ethnic studies were headed by academic BDS supporters than any other discipline. All 13 members of the founding Board of Critical Ethnic Studies signed petitions endorsing BDS. And the Critical Ethnic Studies Association and three of the four professional organizations of foundational groups that make up the discipline, the Latino, Asian, and Native American Studies Associations have all passed resolutions endorsing academic BDS. The final kind of anti-Semitic expression that critical ethnic scholars, uh, critical, critical ethnic scholars practitioners have engaged in is what I call black, uh, excuse me, backlash anti-Semitism. It occurs when Jewish complaints of anti-Semitism in the discipline or among its practitioners are met with further anti-Semitism that draws on classic anti-Semitic tropes of Jewish power and malevolence. For example, after Wellesley College Black Studies professor Tony Martin was widely criticized for promoting anti-Semitic uh, lies about Jews controlling the slave trade, he wrote the book, The Jewish Onslaught, in which he accused Jews of racism and trying to halt the progress of African Americans. More recently, numerous ethnic studies faculty who support the implementation of critical ethnic studies curricula in California K through 12 classrooms 
have called Jewish organizations and leaders racist, white supremacist, and terror baiting for criticizing anti-Semitism in the curricula. Critical ethnic studies negative portrayals of Jews and the Jewish state have undoubtedly contributed to campus anti-Semitism for many years. For example, in the 1990s, San Francisco State was the most, was known as the most anti-Semitic campus in the US, largely because of the anti-Semitic activity of the Pan-African Student Union, a group with strong ties to the school's College of Ethnic Studies. In the 2000s, San Francisco State was again dubbed the most anti-Semitic campus in America, this time because of an anti-Zionist student group, the General Union of Palestine Students, or GUPS, had engaged in extensive anti-Semitic activity involving the denigration and harassment of Jewish students on campus. GUPS too was closely affiliated with the College of Ethnic Studies, particularly the Arab and Muslim Ethnicities and Diasporas Program, or AHMED, which joined the college in 2007, and since then has been a nonstop source of anti-Semitic courses and events, and together with GUPS has been responsible for campaigns to shut down Zionism and pro-Israel expression on campus. Now I want to turn to the California ethnic studies or to return to it and to look what happened to this highly politicized discipline in the years and decades after it was forced into the academy. In the decade following the San Francisco State strike, 20 ethnic studies units were established on 15 Cal State campuses, but ethnic studies growth uh, significantly slowed in the following decades. And when dramatic cuts to the Cal State system in the mid 2000s disproportionately affected ethnic studies departments, many struggled to survive. Things came to a head at the beginning of 2013, when the president of Cal State Long Beach proposed downgrading the school's Department of Africana Studies to a program because of under-enrolled classes. In response, the department chair, Milana Karenga, launched what he called a critical struggle to save the department, which developed into a bold campaign to not only save his department, but to secure the place of ethnic studies throughout Cal State's 23 campuses by making the discipline essential to the university system. As we'll see, the campus had two prongs. The first involved efforts to make ethnic studies a system-wide requirement on all campuses, thereby guaranteeing student enrollment. The second involved efforts to bring critical ethnic studies to K through 12 classrooms, thereby ensuring a reliable pipeline for providing Cal State ethnic studies majors with employment opportunities as K through 12 ethnic studies teachers. The campaign to secure ethnic studies was loosely modeled after the 1968 strike at San Francisco State with some key differences. While the 1968 campaign was almost wholly student driven, the 2013 campaign was orchestrated by a small group of Cal State faculty who were also very well connected professional activists. There are three individuals in particular who have played central roles in the ethnic studies campaign and all three have espoused anti-Semitic and anti-Israel rhetoric. Malana Karenga, the Cal State Long Beach Africana Studies Chair, 
who seems to have set everything in motion, is an important figure in the Black Power, Black Nationalist movement. He founded the organization US, which rivaled the Black Panthers in California in the mid 1960s. In 1994, Karenga publicly defended a prominent Nation of Islam member, Khalid Muhammad, after Muhammad was criticized by the ADL for calling Jews bloodsuckers of the Black nation. More recently, Karenga published an op-ed accusing Israel of racial supremacy, settler apartheid, ethnic cleansing, savage oppression, and radical evil. Malina Abdullah, a Cal State LA professor and longtime chair of Pan-African Studies, is a central figure in the Cal State Ethnic Studies campaign. She has stated that ethnic studies is the intellectual arm of the revolution and that her role and that of other ethnic studies scholars is to use academic positions to promote liberatory political movements. Abdullah herself is co-founder and leader of the LA chapter of Black Lives Matter. And she provides course credit to students who participate in Black Lives Matter political activities. In 2020, Abdullah organized and led the Black Lives Matter protest that turned violent in the largely Jewish Fairfax community, resulting in several synagogues, schools, and Jewish markets being looted and vandalized with anti-Semitic graffiti. When asked about the looting and violence of the demonstrators that day, Abdullah said, we were very deliberate in deciding to disrupt spaces of white affluence. We want to make sure that it's not just black people who are suffering at the hands of white supremacy. Finally, Teresa Montano, who also plays a key role in the K through 12 prong of this campaign is professor of Chicano studies at Cal State Northridge and a former K through 12 educator. Montano calls herself an active unionist and has been on the executive committee board or staff of just about every major teachers union in California. In 2021, Montano co-founded and continues to head the Liberated Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum Consortium, a fee-for-service educational consulting group that develops curricular material for teaching what they call liberated or critical ethnic studies, as well as professional development and teacher training services. Some of the first curricular material posted to the group's website was called Preparing to Teach Palestine, a Toolkit, which included several web pages that used classic anti-Semitic tropes of Jewish wealth and power to vilify pro-Israel Jews and Jewish organizations. It smeared Israel with false charges of settler colonialism and apartheid. It promoted the work of anti-Zionist organizations that call for dismantling the Jewish state, and it offered advice on how to start your own BDS campaigns. Montano herself has endorsed the academic boycott of Israel, and she has accused Jewish leaders and organizations of being racist and white supremacist or criticizing anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in curricular materials that she helped to develop. As we'll see, these three Cal State professor activists very effectively used their connections with faculty and students, K through 12 educators and administrators, outside political organizations, and importantly, with powerful teachers unions and state legislators to achieve their ambitious goals. Back to our timeline, which I'm now going to bifurcate in order to show how the two prongs of this campaign, one playing out at Cal State and the other in the K through 12 system, how they both progressed. 
So let's start with the Cal State timeline. In the summer of 2013, Karenga and Abdullah's friend and former colleague, state assembly member and head of the legislative Black Caucus, Shirley Weber, who had founded the African American Studies Program at San Diego State and taught there for more than 40 years, Weber introduced an assembly resolution supporting the continuation of the state university's Africana Studies programs, which passed unanimously. As a result of the resolution, the Cal State Chancellor promised a moratorium on cuts to ethnic studies and established a task force on the advancement of ethnic studies at the university to which both Karenga and Abdullah were appointed. In 2016, the task force recommended Cal State make courses in general ethnic studies or focused on one of its core groups, African American, Chicano, Asian American, or Native American studies, a general education requirement. But the university not only ignored the recommendation, but in 2017, the chancellor issued an executive order eliminating a general education requirement that included ethnic studies. Of course, this infuriated the task force, including Molina Abdullah, who went back to state legislators for support. In 2019, encouraged by Abdullah, Shirley Weber introduced a bill requiring all Cal State students to take an ethnic studies course in order to graduate. In an act of unusual candor, Weber justified the need for the bill in the legislative record by stating, unless this bill becomes law, ethnic studies courses at Cal State will be decimated. Weber was effectively admitting that the primary purpose of a bill requiring all Cal State students to take a course in ethnic studies was not to benefit students, but to ensure that ethnic studies faculty and departments would survive. This, of course, was the primary goal of the faculty activists who had launched the campaign. Weber's bill was sponsored by the Cal State Faculty Union, the CFA, and supported by Black Lives Matter, the first bill Black Lives Matter officially supported, according to Molina Abdullah. Importantly, the bill was opposed by the administration of every Cal State campus and the Cal State Academic Senate on the legitimate grounds that the state legislature has no business dictating academic policy and programming to a state university. In fact, it's a violation of the basic tenets of academic freedom, and it's antithetical to how a university is governed. But the state legislature sided with the ethnic studies activists and passed the bill, which the governor signed into law, making California the first state in the nation to mandate such a graduation requirement in a four-year public university, and the first time California state legislators ever mandated the academic programming of one of its universities. Although it was a frightening demonstration of state overreach, it was a huge victory for ethnic studies faculty activists at Cal State. In the academic year after this bill was passed, there were more than 40 new ethnic studies faculty searches carried out on Cal State campuses. Because of the new law, ethnic studies at Cal State went from being on the proverbial chopping block in 2013 to being one of the most essential departments on campus less than 10 years later. And as at the birth of ethnic studies at San Francisco State in 1968, these changes were forced onto the university against the will of administrators, this time not by physical force, but by legislative force, which 
as before, left the university no choice but to comply with the will of ethnic studies activists. Now let's consider the parallel but interrelated timeline of the progression of ethnic studies initiatives at the K through 12 level. While the Cal State prong of the ethnic studies campaign was primarily driven by faculty in Africana studies with the assistance of allied state legislators, as we'll see, the K through 12 prong was primarily driven by Latino political groups assisted by allied legislators whose efforts were seamlessly integrated into the campaign to strengthen ethnic studies at Cal State. In 2014, Southern California high school teacher, Jose Lara, a leader in Union del Barrio, an organization that works towards political revolution and the fundamental liberation of all Raza from Chile to Alaska, according to its website, established the Ethnic Studies Now Coalition, a group of K through 12 and higher education ethnic studies educators, students and community members dedicated to establishing ethnic studies graduation requirements in high schools throughout the state. Cal State's Milana Karenga, Malina Abdullah, and Teresa Montano were all part of these efforts, whose first big victory was in November 2014, when Los Angeles Unified School District, the largest in the state, adopted a resolution making ethnic studies a high school graduation requirement. In 2015, Jose Lara took the campaign to the next level with efforts to secure state legislation mandating an ethnic studies requirement for all California high schools. These efforts were to unfold in two steps. The first was making sure that the ethnic studies curriculum adopted by schools for their required classes was based on critical pedagogy. Only then would a state mandated ethnic studies requirement, the focus of the second step of the campaign, be assured to carry out the original goals of the ethnic studies activists. Ethnic studies members helped to draft a bill mandating the development of a state approved ethnic studies model curriculum for high schools, which state assembly member Luis Alejo, chair of the Latino Legislative Caucus, introduced. The bill was officially supported by the largest teachers unions in the state, the California Teacher Association, Teachers Association, at a time when Cal State's Teresa Montano was one of three members of that powerful union's executive committee. It was also supported by Cal State's faculty union, the California Faculty Association, on whose board of directors Montano sat. The bill was signed into law in 2016, encouraging ethnic studies activists to press for the next step of their campaign, a state mandated graduation requirement. So in 2017, Shirley Weber, with encouragement from Ethnic Studies Now, started things rolling by introducing a successful House resolution to, formally, to formalize the Assembly's will to mandate an Ethnic Studies graduation requirement, <clears throat> requirement for all high school pupils. For the next few years, the K through 12 campaign would proceed on two fronts, legislative and curricular. On the curricular front, efforts to ensure that state mandated model curriculum would embrace critical ped pedagogy began in earnest towards the end of 2018, when the Instructional Quality Commission or IQC to which Jose Lara had been appointed, was tasked with selecting ethnic studies educators for an advisory committee to help draft the state's model curriculum. Lara made sure a 
majority of committee members were from his ethnic studies now group, including Teresa Montano. Things took a fateful turn for the activists when the first draft of the state's model curriculum developed by the IQC Selected Advisory Committee was, to, was released for public comment. It generated public furor, particularly in the Jewish community. Steeped in critical pedagogy, the draft centered on the four core critical ethnic studies groups at the university level, Black, Latino, Asian, and Native American, plus one new group that was added at the last minute, Arab Americans. The draft's ideological framework divided society and students into oppressed and oppressors, called for connecting students to resistance movements in order to fight oppressor groups, and it called for challenging all imperialist, colonial, hegemonic beliefs. Although many in the Jewish community were dismayed that Jewish Americans were excluded, what really triggered the community were sample lessons on Arab Americans that suggested Jews controlled the media, condemned the Jewish state, and included a glossary depicting BDS as a global social movement to establish freedoms for Palestinians living under apartheid conditions. 20,000 individuals and almost every Jewish organization in the state submitted comments decrying the anti-Jewish and anti-Zionist bias of the draft. The California Legislative Jewish Caucus argued the curriculum would marginalize Jewish students <clears throat> and fuel hatred, <clears throat> fuel hatred and discrimination against the Jewish community. And Governor Newsom vowed the draft would never see the light of day. Soon after, the State Board of Education rejected the draft and set to work on a new one. Furious at the rejection of their curriculum, which was a crucial piece of their larger plan, in fall 2019, several members of the advisory committee, particularly those suggested by Jose Lara, launched an activist campaign they called Save California Ethnic Studies, demanding the State Board of Ed adopt the original draft curriculum. In 2020, the Save Ethnic Studies group asked dozens of school districts to approve a resolution um, supporting the rejected first draft of the model curriculum, including its lessons on Arab Americans. And by the end of the summer, more than 20 schools did. Early in 2021, the SAVE group organized a final push to get the State Board of Ed to reconsider their rejected first draft by presenting a petition signed by 25,000 individuals, as well as all of the state, the Cal State's uh, ethnic studies departments, the Cal State Faculty Union, and the powerful California Teachers Association. Nevertheless, in March, the Board of Ed adopted a fourth draft of the model curriculum, which the first drafters had decried as being inauthentic, diluted, and superficial. Interesting though, although the final state approved model curriculum was scrubbed of overt anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist content, and even included lessons on Jewish Americans and anti-Semitism. It also contained a set of critical pedagogy infused gu guiding principles that were almost identical to those in the first draft. Informed by these principles, a motivated teacher could easily adapt the state approved model curriculum to include content with anti-Semitic portrayals of Jews and the Jewish state. So switching now to the legislative front. In 2020, a bill requiring all high school students to take an ethnic studies course based on the state's model curriculum was put forward 
by Assembly Member Jose Medina, a member of the Latino Legislative Caucus and chair of the Assembly's Higher Education Committee. The bill, which was supported by the Cal State Faculty Union, passed the legislature but was vetoed by Governor Newsom, largely because of his concern about which curriculum would be used in high schools. In January 2021, Assembly Member Jose Medina introduced another attempt at an Ethnic Studies High School graduation requirement bill, EB 101, which was co-sponsored by the California Teachers Association. However, concern that school districts might not adopt the state approved model curriculum, but instead prefer the rejected first draft or an even more objectionable liberated curriculum from Teresa Montano's group, who had been aggressively marketing their services throughout the state. Members of, the cons members of concerned legislators pressed for the addition of guardrails into the bill to discourage school districts from adopting the rejected first draft or similar curriculum. With the help of these guardrails, Medina's bill passed in the legislature and was signed into law by the governor, who in his signing message stated that he appreciated the guardrail, he appreciated that the guardrails had been added to the bill to, in his words, ensure that courses will be free from bias or bigotry and appropriate for all students. But as the legislators and governor knew well, not one of the bill's several guardrails would actually be able to stop a school district from adopting the rejected first draft or liberated curriculum. What lawmakers and the governor likely did not know, however, was how quickly the liberated group would be able to infiltrate districts throughout the state with their biased and anti-Semitic version of ethnic studies, all thanks to the new ethnic studies graduation requirement. Looking back on the multifaceted campaign to ensure the survival of ethnic studies at Cal State, what I've been calling the politics of ethnic studies, we can see the enormous success of faculty activists. Not only did the legislatively mandated Cal State ethnic studies graduation requirement manage to secure ongoing funding for their departments and rapidly expand their faculty lines, the state mandated high school graduation requirement would mean even more student interest in their departments. And some Cal State faculty like Teresa Montano have even managed to grow a lucrative educational consulting group while promoting a liberated curriculum that further advances the faculty activists' vision. So what does all this mean for those of us concerned about anti-Semitism in K through 12 and college classrooms? I believe that there are crucial lessons that we can learn from, Cal from the California Ethnic Studies Saga, which can help us move forward. First, a careful consideration of the audacious scope of the faculty activist successful campaign, which was fully supported by the powerful teachers unions and the state legislature, gives us a good sense of what we're up against in trying to combat the proliferation of anti-Semitic critical ethnic studies in California schools. Simply put, we are outmanned and outgunned. But recognizing this, appreciating that there are some battles that we probably can never win, is the first step in developing strategies that can succeed. Second, understanding the ultimate goal and basic strategy of the faculty activists campaign, along with its anti-Semitic aspects, can help to formulate and prioritize our own efforts. Let's recall the activist campaign in its broadest strokes. 
their ultimate goal was to save their ethnic studies departments from being eliminated. Their strategy was to make their departments valuable, even essential to the university by finagling ethnic studies graduation requirements at Cal State and in all California high schools. At the high school level, an additional step was needed to ensure that what was being taught was critical ethnic studies, consistent with what is taught in Cal State classes and not some other version of the subject that would not require their expertise. I wanna suggest that each part of the activist game plan can and should be challenged on two grounds. First, its very legitimacy must be called into question because of its use or promotion of anti-Semitism. Starting with the most accessible part of the plan, the critical ethnic studies curriculum or approach, we should be arguing that any curriculum whose conceptual framework includes explicit or implicit anti-Semitic portrayals of Jews or the Jewish state and is likely to lead to anti-Jewish bigotry in the classroom and beyond, such a curriculum is simply illegitimate. So too any state requirement that forces all students to take a course likely to use such an anti-Semitic curriculum and thereby incite anti-Semitic bigotry statewide cannot be a legitimate requirement. Lastly, any plan to strengthen university departments whose faculty regularly traffic in anti-Semitism and transmit it to their students and colleagues, claiming it is part of their disciplinary mission is an illegitimate plan. The second way we should challenge the activist game plan is by questioning its value to respective stakeholders, helping them to see that as the expression goes, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. At the curricular level, for instance, we should be pointing out that the single study repeatedly cited to show that, that ethnic studies has academic benefits has been roundly debunked by prominent scholars. Given the public controversy surrounding a critical pedagogy infused curriculum, why would a school district opt to use it when it offers students no proven educational benefits? With respect to the requirement part of the plan, the squeeze is even more obvious. The state legislature has estimated implementing this requirement will cost $250 million a year. As California faces a $25 billion deficit and a large majority of its high school students already overwhelmed with requirements can't meet state standards in literacy or math, why would the state want to implement such an exorbitantly expensive, academically empty and divisive requirement? And finally, we should be asking Cal State officials, does critical ethnic studies, a highly politicized coercive discipline whose practitioners engage in anti-Semitism that they claim is consistent with their disciplinary mission, does such a discipline have enough value to the university to justify its continued funding? It's a fair question, and it seems that not long ago, Cal State officials believed the answer was no. These are just some general ideas about formulating strategic approaches to the problem. I'd be happy to share details about how my organization has tried to implement them and what more can be done in the Q&A. I also want to remind you that what I've shared today is just one story, not the only story about the California ethnic studies controversy. And in order to tell that one story, there was much that I omitted. Some of these omitted details too can be shared in the Q&A or you can find them in one of the many pieces I've written about this topic over the last few years, which I think uh, Gunther has shared with all of you. So thank you for your attention and for your interest 
in this topic. 